there's a lot to vote on this year. But you know, we just came back Sunday evening from my grandparents' farm, where every year we get together for our pheasant hunt. And I gotta say, the longer I do this job, the more desire I have to turn off my laptop, smash this thing against a rock, and go live as a hermit on grandma and grandpa's farm. We laugh because we know it's true. The peace out there is just incredible. But secluding ourselves to a life of peace when all this is not going on is not what we can do. Abram Kuyper said that when principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, battle is your calling and peace becomes sin. You must, at the cost of dearest peace, lay your convictions bare before friend and enemy with all the fire of your faith. That is what we must do today. And that is what so many well-meaning Christians misunderstand. Yes, we should, when at all possible, live at peace with all men. But we should never bow down to the idol of this concept of peace and tranquility when in reality we should be suiting up. Patrick Henry knew this well. He was speaking to a group of lackluster people who didn't even think they should get involved and stand for freedom years ago in our founding. And he said, gentlemen, will always cry peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has already begun and our brethren are already in the field. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is the gentleman would wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet to be bought at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God, for I know not the course that others may take, but as for me, and then he said his famous line, give me liberty or give me death. In this conflict, we're going to ruffle some feathers. You have to do it right because we should never seek to be somebody's enemy but we have to take a bold stand, even if people don't like it. You know, in the middle of this conflict, you're gonna hear a lot of labels thrown around, right? There's the right-wingers, there's the leftists, there's the, you can come up with 50 different political labels right now, right? You gotta choose the left, the right, the up, the down, the moderate, the middle, the squishy middle, the undecided. The... Let's remember what Reagan told us. He goes, there is no left or right. There is only an up or down, either up, to man's age-old dream, the ultimate in individual freedom, or down to the antip of totalitarianism. That is what we have before us this year in South Dakota. Are we gonna hold up the value of life? Hold up our ability to elect principled leaders? Hold up the value of sobriety and human dignity on our streets and keep marijuana out? Or are we gonna slowly let our state slide down and become just like some of the other states that, well, they're not doing so hot. What are we gonna do here in South Dakota? It's time to stand, it's time to fight. But I've got a question for you. Ladies, if you pull out your purses, any one-sided quarters? Gentlemen, in your pocket, any one-sided nickels? Of course not, because every coin has two sides. We must be bold, we must stand firm, we must fight, but we must have compassion. Most of you know that Family Voice is actually a network. We are a South Dakota organization. There's 40 other states that have a group like ours, independently funded, independently run, just like Family Voice. So we have text threads and email threads. We're always talking to each other. My phone's been going off tonight. I don't know what they're talking about right now. We're constantly reminding each other of things, and we've also developed common catchphrases and reminders that we give to each other in moments of victory, but also in moments of defeat. And of these little catchphrases and reminders and challenges we give to each other, there's one that we all agree rises to the top as the most important. As we talk about elections and policy and lawsuits and legislators and voter turnout. Lead with the gospel. What that means is, that's the most important. And everything we do is keeping the door open for the gospel. And although we will sometimes upset people by our bold stand. We should never be a speed bump on a person's journey to realizing the love of Jesus Christ. We must lead with the gospel. There's an author whose book I appreciated. She was writing about her, her journey out of the LGBT lifestyle. As God was softening her heart, she was beginning to, to give God a chance. Then as a Christian, she writes her book and reflecting back, she writes, why hadn't they, the Christians, ever mentioned the place happiness had within righteousness, or how taking up the cross would be a practice of obtaining delight, 
Delight in all that God is. Even the Savior had this kind of joy in his mind when he endured his cross. So why hadn't they set their focus on the same? In their defense, they were not to blame for my unbelief. I just wonder if they would have told me about the beauty of God just as much, if not more, than they told me about the horridness of hell, if I would have burned my idols at a faster pace. Is that a little bit convicting? We should never become just angry, calloused people. I want to tell you a story of someone I met at the Capitol. This was a number of years ago. We had a, a bill dealing with restroom privacy. And this person, identified as the other sex, came in opposition to the bill, testified. And then afterwards, a legislator that I was friends with began a conversation and kind of tried to, to talk to this person and hang out with them while they were at the Capitol that day. This legislator was a believer. Brought in another legislator and I think two others, also believers. Basically, like, let's circle around this person and just try to be their friend. A few hours later, um, Dale and I were brought in. I don't know where Dale is seated right now. I'm sure he remembers this story. And at the end of that day, the person expressed to us their shock that we were able to show love to them. This person was in their 50s, and they were shocked that a Christian could extend love to them. Is that okay? Is that an indictment on sometimes the way we act? Should we keep that in our mind? Now, I don't know this person's entire story. I don't know what type of Christians or what type of angry people they may have encountered. But I know there was a failure there on behalf of the church broadly. A couple years later, that person took their life. Again, I don't know the person's whole story. But I know they shouldn't have been 52 before they finally found out that a Christian could show love to them. Those are the two things we must hold. We have to be bold fighters with backbones of steel who are not afraid to upset somebody if we need to and stand no matter what comes. And we have to be the most compassionate people in the room, ready to extend love at all times. As you heard tonight in the poem, truth is real love, and love never fails. And as we think about these two things, holding both of these two things, which can feel like opposites, but they're not, they're complementary. I don't think I've met somebody who did this as well as Debbie did. I know we've got a picture of a bunch of her, or of our adventures with her. A lot of you guys know her. This spring was a punch to the gut. As many of you guys know, families in South Dakota have more options when it comes to the birth of their child because of Debbie's efforts. She did not want to get involved in politics. She was drugged to the Capitol by a bunch of moms who cared, and they said, we should advocate for this, and she stepped up. She would tell me story after story of the early days when she was fighting alone. She'd go into committee alone, surrounded by the industry who wanted to kill her bill. They would vote it down, 9081, over and over, she'd lose. She'd barely make it out of the room, holding her composure to go find a corner to privately cry, and a few minutes later, turn right around and keep fighting. Homeschool families in South Dakota have greater freedoms because of the coalition she helped build with the governor. Children in South Dakota, doctors are not allowed to chemically castrate or mutilate their genitals because of the bills that Debbie worked on. Unborn babies are protected because of what Debbie worked on. You ask anyone in the pro-life community, Debbie has led a large aspect of the pro-life community for decades. And she didn't ask for this. She didn't love the spotlight. She actually kind of hated it, which made it easy to embarrass her because you could just brag her up and she would blush her cheeks. And she was so humble. But the legislators in the room, you know the sacrifice that she made to go to the Capitol. And to the families of the legislators and the lobbyists in the room, you especially know the sacrifice that she made and that her family made. The nights she wasn't there, the breakfast she wasn't there to cook, the dinner conversations she missed out on because she chose to winter in pier. Doesn't that sound balmy? 
She left a huge impact on this state and a huge impact on our hearts as well.